Hi guys, Mr. Martin here again. Thanks so much for joining me. Now in this video, what we're going to be looking at is the first in two series of videos where we're going to be looking at designing an experiment. Now designing an experiment in psychology is actually deceptively difficult to do. There's so many different things to take account of. So I'm going to take you through them today. And as I say, we're going to split this into two videos because there's simply too much content to fit into one. So let's dive straight in and get started. So the first question we have to ask there when we're dealing with experiments in psychology is firstly, what is an experiment? Well, an experiment, basically speaking, is the main tool of the scientific method. So every experiment involves making basically a comparison between two or maybe more things in order to find out something about them and to uncover an objective piece of evidence. Now, the logic of an experiment is that if you change one thing, and keep everything else the same, well then any difference must have occurred because of that thing that we changed, right? That's just logic. So in other words, we change one variable and we try to measure its effect on another variable while we keep everything else constant. Therefore, experiments basically aim to study cause and effect and that's the ultimate goal. If we change something, what effect does it have on something else? So how are we going to do this then? How are we going to study cause and effect? Well, to do this we need variables. And there's two basic types of variable. Now a variable is any aspect of behaviour. So uh, heart rate could be a good example of this one. Or it's any stimulus that affects that behaviour. So for example, noise. Now in an experiment we have two key types of variable. They are the IV. Now that IV is short for independent variable. That's the thing that we change. So that in this experiment is the cause. And the opposite of the IV is the DV. That's the dependent variable. The variable that the experimenter is going to measure. In this case, that's the effect. So we change the IV and we note down any effect it has on the DV. So here's a basic example. Sometimes primary school kids would run a very basic experiment where they put one plant in a dark place and they put another plant on a windowsill. The results, if everything else is kept the same, then the one on the windowsill is going to grow bigger, it's going to grow a bit greener, it's going to grow a bit more leafier. Now that is a pretty basic and obvious uh, experiment to us, but such experiments throughout history have allowed us to uncover lots of good facts about plant biology such as the presence of chlorophyll and presence of chloroplast, lots of good things. In this case, the IV is where we place the plant, the cause, and the DV is how leafy it grows. That's the effect. Every experiment involves a comparison. It's not just a case of comparing one thing to another. There's lots of different things to take into account here. So in order to make a comparison, there has to be two or more conditions. And a condition is a part of the experiment that is different. So, for example, if we want to study the effect of, uh, let's say, background noise on revision, you would have a low noise condition and a high noise condition. And what we do here is we compare the effect on people's exam scores. The conditions will be pretty much determined by the IV in this case, so we can have lots and lots of different um, experimental conditions, or perhaps not very many at all. Now, sometimes there's only going to be one experimental condition. This is where we have something, something is present, or it could be something that is going to be there in the room. So in this case, what we also must have is a control condition as well. And a control condition establishes a baseline, measuring how things are under, let's say, relatively normal circumstances. There's other types of variable as well, however. So as we've seen, an experimenter manipulates an IV, and that he or she sees what effect it has on the DV. But in order to make sure that the IV is actually the thing that's having the effect on the DV, then everything else needs to be kept constant. That is crucial to get a good result in an experiment. The thing about experiments, however, is there's lots of other variables that are going to be there. Humans are very fickle creatures. There's lots going on in our lives. So any kind of outside variable that could potentially 
cause a random error in our results? Well, that's called an extraneous variable. An extraneous variable could be things like environmental things, uh, background noise perhaps if we're trying to do a memory test, or it could be something about the participants themselves. So intelligence, IQ, religion, culture, all these kind of things. Now, some variables cannot be eliminated. So for example, a researcher can't avoid the fact that participants are going to have different personalities. That's just a fact of life. Life experiences, they might be tired, they might be in a bad mood. But what the researcher must do is keep the effects of such variables to a minimum by designing the experiment well. There's always going to be a bit of random error, but a well-designed experiment should get rid of as many extraneous variables as possible. However, and here is where it gets a bit complicated. If one of our extraneous variables influences one condition of our experiment more than another, then it becomes a confounding variable. It gets promoted up into one case into a confounding variable. So it then becomes difficult or impossible to know what's actually caused our change in the results. Was it the IV or was it the confounding variable? Let's give you an example so you understand this. Let's say we're interested in the effect of caffeine on short-term memory. In one condition, we might give them a pretty big dose of caffeine. In another condition, we give them a fairly low dose of caffeine. So in this experiment, participants might respond, just by nature, differently to caffeine. Now that's an extraneous variable, responding differently, but it's not a confounding variable because we're going to use the same participants in both conditions. So we've designed it so that extraneous variable doesn't become confounding. However, if our experimental group who used, let's say, the high dose of caffeine also just by chance had more time to study, then study time is the confounding variable. So if the experimental group, the one that the high dose of caffeine was given to, if they did better, well, was it the fact that it was the high dose of caffeine or was it just that they were given more time to learn the material? We don't know. So at that point, it's difficult to conclude anything from the experiment whatsoever. So how are we going to design our experiment then to make sure that confounding variables don't influence our results? The word design, we have to be super careful here. Design has a specific meaning. It's not just how you make or how you put together your experiment. It means how are we going to allocate our participants to our various conditions? Now, in reality, we have about three main ways to do that, and those are called repeated measures, independent measures, and matched pairs. Let's look at each of these in turn very, very quickly. Repeated measures, every participant completes every condition. On the right-hand side of the screen, here's a good example. We've got the effect of noise on, let's say, memory. In condition A, silence. And we've got the five group of guys who do a little memory test. In condition B, lots of noise, but then we have the same group of guys doing the same memory test. Every participant completes every condition. What's the good thing about this? Good thing is that it keeps participant variables to a minimum. Basically, these guys are going to have natural variability, different IQs, different memory spans, different personalities, different moods, etc, etc. But if we're using the same guys in each condition, well then participant variables don't matter because all that's changing between these two things, these two groups, is the fact that there's music playing and no music playing. What's the downside to this, however? The downside are something called order effects. Look at participant E there, right at the end. Presumably, person A goes first, then B, then C, then D, and then E comes in right at the very end. He's been waiting around for ages. He's a bit bored, he's a bit fatigued, he's a bit tired so he might perform more poorly. And then look at condition B. Participant E again is going last. By the time that he comes around the second time, he's been waiting for hours. No wonder he's going to do differently to how he would normally. That's an order effect. You can get around that by counterbalancing. So you go A, B, C, D, E, and then you go C, D, E, A, B in the next one, but it's up to the experimenter to do that. Also, in a repeated measure study, Demand characteristics, characteristics sorry, are very likely. So this means that the participants will alter their behaviour according to the perceived requirements of the situation, or in particular, to the researcher's 
wishes. They kind of second guess what the researcher wants them to do and then they behave accordingly. Humans just want to please each other after all, so that's something we have to bear in mind as well. Independent measures uses two groups of different people, two separate groups for each condition. So the same experiment we just mentioned there, group A, A, B, C, D and E, they have the quiet please. And then F, G, H, I and J for condition B, five entirely different guys. Now, it's not really ideal to compare two separate groups of individuals now, because we have participant variables. And the main reason for doing this is when a repeated measure study isn't possible. So, for example, if there's an element of deception that would make the aims of the study obvious if both participants did both conditions. So sometimes we are forced into an independent measures uh, experiment. What are the upsides of independent measures? Well, there's no order effects. Person A, B, C, D and E they're fine, then they go away, and then an entirely different group of people come in. There's no order effects, nobody's really getting bored here, nobody really is going to affect the results that way. Downsides to independent measures, however, are participant variables. A, B, C, D and E, and F, G, H, I and J, well they're all different guys. So if there is any difference between these two groups, was that down to the music that was playing? Or was it down to the fact that they are just entirely different people. We don't know that 100% for sure, so it's a bit of a limited uh, design in this case. Matched pairs is an interesting one. Now, matched pairs is all about minimising participant variables. What we do here essentially is get two different groups of people, so similar to independent measures, but with one key difference. We match each participant to someone exactly or almost like them, as close to that person as possible. So here's our experiment, last one here. We've got person A, B, C, D and E matched with a different group, F, G, H, I and J. But person A is matched with person F in as many different variables as possible. Religion, ethnicity, IQ, memory span, you name it, those two people are pretty much identical. Once we've got our match pairs, then we divide them up between the different conditions. So it's a way of minimizing participant variables. That's the main thing that we use the match pairs design for, is to get rid of that. As well as that, of course, we're also avoiding the order effects similar to independent measures. What's the downside, however, of using match pairs? In this case, it's very time consuming. You have to find someone as identical as possible, and that takes a lot of time. As well as that, it's not massively practical, especially if they're recruited gradually over a long period of time. It's taken ages to find them. By that time, your experimental money might have run out, run dry, and you're basically left um, up a creek with no paddles. So you have to be really careful with a matched pairs design. Key concepts then, guys. We've got the IV, independent variable, what's changed. We've got the DV, the dependent variable, what's measured. The two types of other variables there, extraneous and confounding, and then the three types of experimental design. Remember that design means participant allocation and nothing else. Now that's everything for this video, guys. I hope you've learned a little something. In our next video, it's gonna be the second in our videos into experimental uh, design, experimental um, know-how, and we're gonna be looking at the difference between lab and field experiments. Until then, guys, have a great day. Hope everyone's well, and we'll see you again next time. Cheers.